Hey, Typology Tribe, Ian Morgan Cron here, host of the show on which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the, through the lens, lens of, of the, the Enneagram. Enneagram. I'm here with Anthony Skinner. <laughs> We're not recording in our normal studio. We're in my cottage office. Yes, we are. This is great. Here in downtown Franklin, Tennessee. I'm sitting on the couch here with my best friend, Percy. No offense, Anthony. Well, Percy. Percy. Uh, no, no offense taken. Percy the Golden Doodle. All curled up here, napping yes, he away is. on the couch. That's a fine creature, isn't it? He is. He's yeah. a sweet one. Guileless, wonderful. Yeah. yeah everything you would want <laughs> people to be, but they aren't. Right. 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 Yeah. So how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm. Yeah. Uh, you just got back from a trip. I did. Tell us about it a little I bit. Went, yeah, I went to. I went on break to uh, uh, Solana Beach, California. Yeah. In San Diego. You took some other friends with you. Randy and Katie Williams. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it was hysterical. Uh, you know, Katie, of I course. mean, oh, good Lord. She, she's un, ungoverned. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's some, that's a, that's a power couple in ways that can't be imagined. Yes. Um, but we had a blast. Yeah. Awesome. It was so beautiful. Yeah. I could move to California. I love my time there. Yeah. yeah I was up North. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I you're could, going back next week. Speaking yeah. of Catalyst in awesome. Irvine. Yeah. I've never been to Irvine. What's That'll that be like? be a little different experience. Then. I guess it would be. With a name like Irvine, I don't know. I, I've never been, but I, I yeah. guess it'll it'll be all right. I'm I'm a, a more excited today than normal. All right. Yeah. Tell about, us about it. Yeah, well, we've got my, my friend Dan Hasseltine on the show. Awesome. And for those of you who don't know uh, Dan, Dan is a, uh, a songwriter. He's uh, an author. He's an activist. Uh and he's best known for singing lead vocals for the, no, this is going to be funny, the Christian alternative folk rock pop uh, acoustically Acoustic. driven band <laughs> Jars of Clay. Yes. Uh, which I'm sure that many of our listeners will uh, re remember fondly, if, and I'm sure many still continue to listen to that music. But I, I really uh, got to know Dan post Jars, mm. really, and... Yeah maybe what eight years ago was that when when did oh, you yeah, guys that would that would be close we we got off the road five almost five years ago now right. that's right it so was, you guys were still out and doing stuff yeah i mean we were doing stuff but it wasn't you were winding down we yes exactly you were winding. well you yeah. had a heck of a run it mm -hmm. was a good long run we were like forrest gump we we just kept running and then <laughs> and then one day we just woke up. we said i we don't want to run anymore oh and we went home yeah. Well, there you go. Over the years, I mean, not not only you, but I've developed a real affection for Steve and Charlie, and and um, it's yeah. been fun to. You were some of the like sort of the first sort of handful of people I started to get to know when when I moved to town. So it's it's kind of fun to have you in, and I'm also excited because you're a five. Yeah, I am. I am definitely a five. Yeah, we don't get many we, fives. We don't because they don't like to come they don't out. Like to, <laughs> no, right. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And that, I appreciated that you chose to be here in your cottage versus at uh, the the other studio because there's probably a lot more people over there. And <laughs> there are, there are. <laughs> especially I can today. Still, I feel I was pulling in, but I still felt like I was withdrawing. So <laughs> that's good. Yeah. And you know what's what I'm really excited about is you're a five with a four wing. Yeah. Which is a whole different critter than a five with a six wing. Thank you for saying so. We were laughing. We mm -hmm. we exchanged texts the other day and I was yeah. like, You're you're David Byrne from Talking Heads, uh, man. Bob Dylan? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. I think he's four with a five. He could be a four with a five yeah. or a five with a four. I don't know. He could be a five with I, I mean, I don't know the guy. So I mean, I David Byrne is a hero of mine. Oh. So, is he really? Oh yeah. I mean, I read his his like massive book uh, about music and That's so great. and then I've been a Talking Heads fan and oh, just I love Talking yeah Heads. so I yeah so the fact that you even mentioned that in a text you know that made me incredibly happy <laughs> yeah well I could also put in Georgia O'Keeffe yeah that's a five yeah, yeah, or yeah, four yeah. do you know the artist Agnes Martin hmm. she's a five or sure. a four boy I'll, I'll give get you to know yeah I've got a big art book at home you can see it okay about Agnes Martin good uh, another um, I think probably Tim Burton's a five or the four. He's kind of got that. Thing. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, that that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. I mean his 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 style. He tends to push off from the norm. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. 
I want to circle back to Tim Burton because it actually okay. triggers something for me. But first, for those people who don't know, let's just talk a little about sort of the give them a fifty thousand foot review of what a five is, right? Yeah, sure. Why don't you, why don't you take it first? Oh man, it'll be harder for me to to describe. But um, the five is is kind of the we're a withdrawing stance, right? So we're so we tend to to be a little bit of a a loner. Um, although I, I I would say that. Um, it's more because we're processing things. We're a lot of internal processors. We're, we like to kind of look at the landscape and look at what's happening. Like if we walk into a party, if I walk into a party, I'm, I'm not jumping in right away. I'm sort of just looking and seeing what's happening Mm -hmm. and then I'll go move forward and, and go and, and engage with people. Um, the intellectual, um, we, we, yeah, I, I, I take a lot of, time and energy thinking about processes and things ahead of time before I jump into something. I, I've got a pathway pretty well figured out before I start walking. Um, that, that's how I would describe mm-hmm. a five. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things we say about fives is that they have a an unconscious, I like to say really more it's versus motivation, I think a strategy, mm. right? Yeah. So it's an unconscious strategy to... That consists of collecting knowledge and information to fend off what feels like an overwhelming, unpredictable, chaotic world and Mm -hmm. to defend, right, against it and to keep it at bay. Um, That sound right? Yeah, it it does feel like it's a bit of a, almost a control mechanism for, for keeping, yeah, keeping the hurts away at, you know, yeah. The hurts. Now, I've never heard a five say that. Oh, well, good. Then that's the four in me getting excited. <laughs> yeah. Well, what does that mean? Like when you say uh, like I just fending mean, like, off hurts. I mean, normally I hear people just say fending off the possibility of being overwhelmed by the world. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I, I also carry that that sense. I, I think I I came into my five. A lot of it, when I look back on it, I think that it was a response to rejection. It was mm. a response to, um, to the way that at first maybe I did step into relationships um, a little bit more freely, and then um, I think I learned that that those kinds of things can be painful. That bringing the fullness of myself, I think I kind of learned to step out of my emotional space uh, over the years and and so the intellectual side to be able to think about something to be able to strategize about the way i was going en- to enter a room or build a relationship was a protection mm, that's really so it's just so interesting i hear you're four mixing with five because you're yeah this is what makes five with four so fascinating right is you have this powerful intellect on one hand and but connection to the emotional space on the other and you're doing both at the same time right now yeah you're talking about hurts which is not how fives normally lead right right they don't lead with that kind of information Mm -hmm. that kind of emotional information but at the same time you're speaking about it in an intellectually very coherent and thoughtful way yeah see (laughs) <laughs> of course yeah. i've given you a drink and you're probably That's perfect this is, Some of when it i have a five be, yeah. i always give a five a bourbon to get because the thing that going gets the four out yeah no, um <laughs> that's great yeah. <laughs> yeah so it, that's a that's an interesting insight because you know i've heard people say this and i think to some degree it's true that our personality forms in response to a wound uh or to trauma mm-hmm. do you remember a time in your life when pre you say pre five if i can say that yeah uh, right, the right. formation of the uh, mm-hmm. or the concretizing let's say of the five personality do you remember a time when there was a more emotionally available open heartedness to the world and mm. and then what what was the moment at which you felt like oh relationships are scary people get hurt here's my strategy for making sure that doesn't happen again here comes the five you know yeah i mean i think it's you know even as you ask the question I, I I almost want to backtrack and go oh maybe I maybe I don't remember because I I feel like I was pretty calculated most of my life but um, but there was it felt like high school for me was was actually the time when 
I made a conscious choice mm. to to go, oh, I need to step back. I need to take things a lot slower. Mm. I need to be very calculated. Um, and that was really in response to feeling embarrassed, um, feeling um, like I had kind of pulled the veil back on who I was too much. And all of a sudden I was exposed. I was vulnerable and I didn't like that feeling at all. Um, as a, as a kid, I, I grew up in a family that was pretty challenging. We, we, um, my family was, was pretty rough. Uh, we had a lot of, a lot of fighting in our family. Um, there was alcoholism, there was workaholism, there was knockdown drag outs and, you know, domestic abuse at times and things that were all going on. And, and so I think there probably was even from the time, you know, as early as I remember stories from when I was five and six years old, I was, I was always a bit protective, you know, both of my own, I kept my own emotions to my, you know, close to the vest, but then also just being sort of protective of other people, um, in those scenarios. Mm. So it, so there was definitely, there was a lot of, there was a lot of trauma in my history, in my past. Um, and, and it certainly all kind of confirmed that, that sense of, okay, you need to tread very carefully as a human being, or, or there's not going to be enough of you to, to go around later on. Mm. Yeah. So I've certainly felt that. So you've used the word calculated a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, when you say calculated, what does that mean? Um, it probably means uh, not sh- just not showing my hand very mm. often. Like if I if I really liked somebody, like you know, back in junior high or something, I was the last person to ever say anything. I was always it would take me a year before I would actually engage with a person that I was feeling some sense of connection to. You know, things like that that I would play it really safe. So yeah. one of the one of the other names for the five is the observer, mm-hmm. right? And I kind of regret now that I didn't because I went back and forth about should I, should I call it the investigator? Should I call it the observer? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I kind of regret not calling them fives the observers because yeah. to me now, after more time and study and you know whatever, yeah. I think observers better. And I'm wondering is as as you were just saying that did you spend a year observing? that person collecting information Mm. before you acted yes well i want to know the outcome before you before i engage with somebody you know and i think that's that feels a little cowardly (laughs) you know (laughs) we all cowards yes but uh (laughs) but i do think but there is that um that sense like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna ask this girl if she's gonna break my heart or Mm. i'm not gonna do I'm not going to step into this activity or whatever, if it's going to be problematic for me. Like I will, I will wait until I know, and I've got a good lay of the land. So I know where my exits are and I know, like I know how to navigate this situation with the least amount of uh, cuts and bruises. I think that's, that's just been my, my way Mm. over the years. It's been my way in almost every aspect of what I do. Like I'm, I'm not the, the guy who just jumps in and without, knowing at least three or four of the potential outcomes. If I'm reading the choose your own adventure book, like <laughs> I've already, I know the ending of all the, the adventures <laughs> before I start reading. And all yeah. that's in service to what? Like, do you, like in your mind, you're thinking if I know all the outcomes, then right. what? Then I won't be hurt as badly because I'll be able to sort of control that, um, whatever it is, that is that pain. Right. that would come at me. Um, and I wouldn't be, I would be able to have some sense of order because I think in the end it would re- it would sort of say that if I can actually predict, then, then I have some sense of the, the order of things. And that for some reason is a, you know, that, that feels like a good, mm. um, I, I, I'm, the word escapes me, but, um, it's, it's a safeguard. It really is. It's saving me from being surprised or feeling out of control, mm. which is kind of going back to what you had said about we're control. You know, we, we look at a world that seems out of control. And so we, 
internalize and we, we investigate and observe to try to find the pieces that we can put in a certain order that makes sense to us, mm. um, control our environment. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, uh, when I think about fives, um, there's usually one of two ways that fives describe their childhoods, right? One would be that they had a lack of meaningful attachment, uh, mm-hmm. emotional, uh, physical attachment, um, interactions, meaningful interactions with their caretakers. Uh, or, so that's one right. possible yeah, way. Yeah. Or that they experienced what uh, the Jungians would call overwhelmment. It's not an actual word, but we all know immediately mm-hmm. what it means, right? It, yeah. It's um, this feeling like I'm going to be flooded. I'm going to get flooded here with trauma or hurt, or there's just so much going on around me. So I'm going to go up into the mental realm and hide out. Uh, And it's like, uh, this is my fortress against the chaos and the fear, right? Is that, which of those two or both? To hear you describe it, I would say it's both. Um, a resounding yes to the first first scenario yeah um the second what it what it reminded me of was that i spent most of my childhood i'm you know as a musician i i bought a keyboard and i would sit up in my room with headphones on and compose music and that was the only time i would come out of my shell that was my only sort of emotional outlet uh and everything else was 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 kept pretty Pretty much, I was just the intellectual guy, just internalizing and thinking things through, and letting things just spin in my head until it made sense to me. Mm. Um, so yeah, that that was. So they were both true of me, I guess. Yeah. yeah, people tend to think of musicians, you know, as being all heart. You know what I mean? Like it's right. all heart. But you yeah. know, some. I mean, I know tons of artists mm. who, who for them, music is more like math. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's actually very analytical. It's, you know, it's right. It, it's almost like physics. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but with that four wing, that's what makes you, that's the power, man. Mm-hmm. You've got that mind that says this is physics, right? Yeah. I mean, you could be an acousticologist, you know, like this is like, this is Bach, right? Right. This yeah, is can... freaking math. Mm-hmm. It's like gorgeous. It's beautiful math is what right. it is. It's like, yeah, just dripping with reason and sensible and at the same time transcendent and yeah you know i don't know if that you if you're getting a sympathetic ring in the bell oh yeah yeah i mean i yeah music it i've spent over the years like various moments you know i think every musician probably does this where they they kind of go all right what is this thing music and why why has it got such a grip on me um and I still this day, it still feels like it's such a mystery um, mm. how music became kind of the the greatest companion. Mm. You know, in in some ways, I would almost attribute it and go, okay, what if what if the spirit? You know, we talk about Christ leaving his spirit. What if what if the spirit is music? Oh, now you're taking me oh. someplace now because I yeah. like okay, so. We're going to depart for a second because the, the four and the five here are going to do a thing. Yeah. Right? Our four wing, your wing and my core number. Um, there's a, I have a friend of mine who's a, you know, a guy who teaches theology of music at, um, at Duke and his name is Jeremy Begbie. And he talks oh, about yeah. um, the, he says that the Trinity is best understood sonically. Right. Hmm. So you have a triad, you have three separate notes mm-hmm. and yet, they intermingle, right? Yeah. But they maintain their own identity. So if you have a C chord, C E G one three five, um, they um, uh, remain C E and G. But when you play them together, they intermingle, and the presence of one highlights the beauty of the other. Right. Right. Yeah. You you can't escape. Unlike visual art, you can't escape sound. Sound is everywhere. It moves at yeah. seven hundred and fifty miles an hour right yeah all those frequencies are flying around us and also then you think about how s- m- with music you can't see it but you can sense its activity see it's all sounds like god yeah well and it is the thing that that continues to flow through the barrier right between what we know as our current state and the afterlife 
Right. Like it is the thing that they say still exists. Right. Like there will be music in heaven. Like there, there seems to be no doubts in terms of that kind of paradigm that, that music will transcend yep. life. Yep. And and therefore it, it has this, and it has all that power. Like right. it is the thing that makes us really be, you know, for me, it's the thing that draws my emotion out. Yeah. Like I don't, I'm not a crier. I'm not a person. I can be pretty distant. I can feel kind of cold and sometimes be actually frustrated that I don't feel more than I do. Mm -hmm. Um, and that it's always up in my head. Right. But you know, I went and saw Paul Simon right. play and it was his, that farewell to her. And, and the first notes that came out for the song Graceland, I was surprised and I just was overwhelmed and mm. I just began to cry. Yeah. And, and it was surprising. It was, but I realized it was like, wow, this is music just is the, mm. the thing that, that actually makes me a bit more of a whole person. Mm. Um, it takes, it kind of blurs the line, right? But you know, all of a sudden I'm on all the numbers right. when I'm listening to music or it's doing its work. And that's, mm. that's just a, a strange phenomenon to me. All right, we're going to come back in a second. I'm going to run a, uh, <clears throat> talk about our sponsor for a moment, but I got a great, great question for you when, when we when we come back in one second. Um, as most of you know, I'm a uh, I'm a psychotherapist and I'm a spiritual director, and I'm always encouraging people to seek out you know counseling and psychotherapy and and just uh, finding companions, qualified companions to help us on the journey toward becoming whole people. One of the lessons I've learned is that not everybody benefits from a traditional 50-minute hour or even the, the typical weekly session. And this, my friends, is why some people, even though they may have a great therapist, can go to couples therapy or personal counseling for months or even years and never really get anywhere or really make much progress. And this is why I'm a big fan. I'm a big believer in uh, the intensive counseling process at Restoring the Soul in Colorado. Restoring the Soul was created by my longtime friend, Michael Cusick, to help couples or individuals experience deep change in half-day blocks over one or two weeks. Mike and his team, they know that sometimes you can't wait months or years to get to the bottom of an issue or to experience breakthrough. So for nearly 20 years, they've helped couples and individuals transform their relationships and their lives. So if you're looking to get out of the rut you're in but can't wait months or years, you can call Restoring the Soul today for a free consultation. Anthony's got his pen out, right, getting ready to write down the number. I'm writing it down. All right, 303-932-9777, 303-932-9777. Call that number. You can learn how their intensive counseling process can jumpstart your journey toward becoming a more whole human being. As a special bonus, just for Typology listeners, Make sure to visit www.restoringthesoul.com forward slash typology to download their PDF called Five Ways Unaddressed Trauma May Be Derailing Your Relationship. Mm. Mm. That's deep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's, an, here's a question for you. Okay. You were what, 20 when JARS started? Yeah. Okay. So you're a baby, essentially. Yep. Right? Although I, you know, I was in college, so I yeah. knew everything. Yes. Right. You yeah. were a dumb baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So uh, delusion, delusional yeah, exactly. anyway, right? Yeah. So you're thrust into a world where there is, there are people everywhere um, and there's probably no escaping them. Uh, and you're on a tour bus with other people all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you're besieged you're probably every minute of the day you're on the tour so you're going from radio stations to concert halls to etc how does a five possibly survive a world that isn't just got people in it it's people ripping at you i mean dragging you into like taking everything a five cares about privacy personal information uh you know just everything yeah. how did you survive it um <clears throat> that's a great question I, I don't really know. Um, if I think about it, there are a couple things in that in that history that were always the things that was hardest hardest for me. One was the amount of information that that people did want to get, mm -hmm. like the personal side. 
I one of the things that got me into music was this sense of um, being able to be a character. Mm. You play a certain role. You um, the music kind of allows for a certain kind of stage. So you tell a certain narrative through the art, um, but it doesn't have to be me. Um, I can play right. somebody else. Um, when you're in the Christian music world, though, and you go into a radio station, they're not asking you about your music. They're not asking you about your stage performance or right. how did you create this certain kind of art. They're asking you, what do you eat for breakfast? What are your kids like? <laughs> Tell us about your family. And all of these things right. that were making me a human being to yeah. them, which which I totally get. And but but it was the the hardest thing to reconcile because part of what I loved about music was while it was the conduit for me feeling things, I didn't want it to be the conduit for me having to reveal who I was like right. I didn't want to be exposed in that space I wanted to play a, a role and be a character right um, and most of the music that I listened to growing up it was you know it was bands like well it was artists like you know David Bowie and it was right. Depeche Mode and these these artists that really took on a character and, and had a narrative right. that they were serving and it wasn't they weren't just being them um, and so that's what I thought I was getting into. So, mm. so for the history, that was the hardest part was, oh, they really, they mm -hmm. want to know me as a human being. And I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, being on the tour bus, that kind of space, I would, I would go and get in a bunk and put on headphones and listen to music. I spent a lot more time in the dressing room and then I would get busy. I would just kind of do manager, managerial kinds of tasks and that was the way that I kept myself um, at a distance from the people around me and the fans and everything. I, I was able to just be busy. Um, but that's what I did. I just thought of something when we were talking. If I'm not, tell me if I'm wrong on this, but I think I'm right. S Steve's a four, right? Steve is a four, yeah. You're a five. Mm -hmm. Charlie's a nine. Yeah. Four, fives, and nine are all in the withdrawing stance. Right. You all were withdrawing from each other under pressure. Is that is that what happened? Yeah, and well, and Matt also the right. uh, the fourth guy. He's a he's a five with a six know, wing. So, so yeah, but wow. we were all withdrawing stances. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That makes for a quiet bus. It yeah. was a, it was quieter on the bus. And you wow. know, you hear all the stories about bands that like they get in these fights and everyone's just punching each other and kicking each other. Right. And they get these big things. We. We were scanners. Like we were just thinking about each other and melting each other's brains with our silence. <laughs> wow. There was no like we never had these knockdown drag out fights. Every once in a while we would have like like everything would just blow up, but it was very rare. More often than not, we would just we wouldn't talk to each other for weeks. And we would get on stage and we would do our thing. Right. And then we'd get off stage and get back on the bus. But it was silent. That is hysterical. I think it was Rush. It was it was it Rush, Anthony? Remember on the yeah. on the thing? And they were like, I think they're all fives. Oh, Do you know what I mean? That wouldn't surprise me. And yeah. they were like, you know, yeah. they were on the road with like Van Halen or somebody, Kiss, right? I Remember this? Kiss, yeah. And they were like, they're like, yeah, we got people would be like partying their brains out. And we'd be back in our room reading books and <laughs> yep. like gaming, right. playing like <laughs> totally. Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. you know. And yeah. they they never did drugs. They never right. drank. They didn't smoke. Yeah. They were just kind of geeks, yeah. like yeah. you know, like in a wonderful. Kind of like the wonderful nerd. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. They just love music. They right. love doing what they're doing. And that music does sound kind of fivey. Oh, well, it? I yeah. mean, it's so cerebral. Yeah. 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 That's why girls, like, you're not going to get a date at a Rush concert. Really. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't dance to it. And I think that's intentional uh, that for Rush. That is so funny. But, yeah. That is so true, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. You, mm -hmm. you can really see it in the music. But oh, just yeah. seeing in that, when that's they were great. talking about... But I just remember in the in that documentary, man, they were like, you know, Van Halen would kick our door in and like, Yo, let's party. And they'd be like staring at him with like owls sitting on a branch, you know, like not, yeah. not knowing what to do. We did that. We uh, we had a, this sort of a funny little story that jars. We were out touring and um, it was right around the time this this U2 book came out, U2 at the end of the world. And it was all about their kind of travels and making uh, the Octone Baby album and and one of the things in the book that you recognize is that God, these guys, they they finish a show and then they go out and they're out having drinks with people and partying until 
the morning and then they go to sleep and we thought man we're we just don't do any of that as a band and so for we kind of looked at each other and we said okay this week or let's just let's try to stay out more after shows let's go somewhere and let's go grab a drink and let's try to try to do a little bit more on the back end of the shows and we it, we lasted about a week we really did it was <laughs> it's a week and then we were like we we're exhausted Nobody wanted to be near anybody else. It was just like, oh, this is terrible. We we can't do it. So we kind of felt like we weren't a real rock and roll band after that, which is probably true. <laughs> Fours, fives, and nines on a bus, man. That That's is really, wild. How long did it take you guys yeah. to like actually know each other? A long time. Mm-hmm. A long time. Wow. Uh, a good, I would say, 11 or 12 years. Really? Wow. Honestly, yeah. And what... Yep. Would you finally feel safe enough after twelve years to, to like to actually have a conversation that got down to the level of the heart? Or yeah, I, it really was. It was. It actually was a a, a few of us started um, engaging in twelve step uh, work and recovery work, and we were going to meetings and realizing that we knew guys that we had just met only a couple weeks. Right. earlier more than we knew the guys mm. that we had been traveling with for a decade. Wow. And, and I think that was a, we recognized that we were really not taking advantage of a, an incredible gift that we had of being able to mm. travel and know each other for so long. But we really did. We, we, it was superficial mm. for the most part for a good, good 12 years. And then finally we go, went, Oh, this is how you're supposed to do this. Huh. And it changed things for us. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you, man, I've been, um, recently I've been going back to meetings again and, um, after, you know, being spotty over the years, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I would not go for a while and then I'd hit a bump and get like a little squirrely and I'd go three mm-hmm. or four weeks to, you know, uh, and, but my thing is drugs and alcohol, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, and so I've been back lately, um, sort of in that space and I'm as a four, I don't know how you feel, but I would go to those meetings. Like even I went to a meeting last night and I do sit in the back and mm-hmm. feel awkward and I do withdraw. I get very quiet. And yeah. Normally like, like now I'm pretty talkative, but there's like three people in here, you know, mm-hmm. I'm in a meeting at St. George's last night. There's like 40 guys, right? That's I, my nightmare. It is. Yeah. It is kind of my nightmare too, because yeah. especially when it's all men, I feel like it's even more weird. It's like, yeah. I'm more awkward. <laughs> Like they're yeah. all fist bumping and like chest bumping. And I'm like, I don't even know if I have testosterone. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh man. Yeah. We could talk about that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's true. Yeah. Talking about, you know, just going into observer mode. Right. Mm-hmm. But those 12 steps, there really is something, you know, I don't want to ascribe any magical thinking to them, but there is something about them that maybe when the heart's ready can, Mm. can crack some things open mm. um in a really efficient and pretty fast yeah well for me it was allaying that fear that if i actually tell my story and mm. the things that i'm actually thinking about and the way that i'm really ordering my world or the assumptions i'm making about myself right. um that people are going to run away mm. for me like mm. the minute i started seeing guys like opening up and telling these these yeah. incredible stories of, of you know, real depravity and people being, you know, extra human in that sense. Like it's, are fully human right. and, um, and going, wow, I, my response to them is actually to love them, to care for them more. Mm. Oh, that's probably what would happen if I told my story. Mm. And that's where it kind of hit me. Right. Like I didn't feel, and, and with all of the kind of attachment issues that, you know, of, of just the five development that happens, you know, it's easy for me to just have a reason not to open up more. Right. And so immediately this, this kind of allayed that fear for me and allowed me to open up. That's fascinating. So as a five, a person who tends to be very private withdrawing somebody who tends to try to find peace by excluding the outside world, mm-hmm. right? Trying to create peace through excluding the outside world. In that space, you tr- find peace slowly by including the outside. Mm. Is that is that what happens? I or think is that- so, but it's also, I mean, part of it is that 
you're in a meeting and it's still exclusive, right? It's still an exclusive space where you are, um, like you're not out with a megaphone telling right. your story to the world necessarily. Right. You, it's it's a group of people that have decided that they're going to be a good steward of your right. story. Mm, that's well um, said. And and so in that space, it still felt exclusive. It was still a withdrawing from the world in one sense, but it was withdrawing in a pack right. versus as an individual. Right. Well, and I guess that's the beauty of of you know anonymity, mm -hmm. right? Is you yeah. can tell your story, and it's sort of held in trust. Yeah. By the group, mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember being in a meeting one time, and this woman just, so, just told an appalling story. It was one of those stories, you know, you know, she wasn't just a meth addict; she was running a meth lab. You know what I mean? And yeah. it, it was yeah. like, oh boy, this is going to get bad, and it got it got ugly, yeah. right? And um, uh, I mean, she'd been a hooker. She. I mean, you know, sold her daughter to get meth. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you know, right. for, I mean, it yeah. got really dark. And she got to the end of her talk. And this was a speaker's meeting. And normally, you know, you get to the end of a speaker shares their story for 30 minutes. And then people respond for 30 minutes about where they connect it to their story, that person's story. Yeah. People were dead silent. She brought everybody to silence. It was that bad. Wow. Now that you got to work hard in, in a meeting. Yeah. To bring people to silence. Right. Right. And finally, this old gal in the back of the room, she had this old whiskey voice, you know, and she was, I mean, she'd been in the program like 50 years, you know, and she'll hear from the back of the room in this dead silence, the word of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The yeah, word exactly. The word of the Lord. Yeah, yes. she just basically yeah. said that this woman had just given the gospel in wow. her story. And all we could do in the silence was say, thanks be to God. Wow. Yeah. You know, and it's so Things powerful shit yeah. happens in those rooms, man. Right. There's no other yeah. way to say it, right? Yeah. Just powerful I, shit goes down in those rooms. I think it's and I think it's important. That was that sent me on a journey for sure. To be able to be it in a place and actually tell my story. Cause I don't, you know, I was in the Christian music world. Like we're you're not allowed to actually tell your story. Yeah. You're not allowed to share your true human right. nature in that space. Um, and in fact, you know, my biggest criticism of the CCM space is always that um, it is it is the least human expression of art that I've experienced in my life mm. is is what they've set up in this CCM space. Right. And I've, I have. Yeah, it's it's problem. Mm. Yeah, it yeah. sure is. And, uh, and in some ways, um, yes. Mm. Well, you know, we've discussed this, right? Yes. <clears throat> Bad things happen when you mix spirituality, yeah, right, yeah. money, mm -hmm. and you know, I mean, commerce, music, art, commerce, art, and money, and yeah. religion. Throw them all together, see what happens. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get. Uh, yeah. You get. Yeah. <laughs> you'd be better off. You'd be better off handing your kid a lighter and telling him to go play in the garage with the accelerants. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, exactly. And see more people blow up as a result. You yeah. know over the years than, uh, than, than most people. And it's, it's fairly sad when it happens. It's always sad. Right. Fives are some of the most, I would argue, possibly the most sensitive number on the Enneagram. Yeah, tell me more about that. <laughs> <laughs> I need more information. Yes, I need uh, more. Yeah. Well, I mean, behind, I mean, you know, the experience people have of fives often is they're very aloof, loners, um, Emotionally distant, emotionally unavailable. Um, um, they're inaccessible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, sometimes people will tell me about their five partner or friend. You know, I, I just can't get through to them. And I'm like, well, that's because you're coming up against the psychological boundary of the five. And yeah. It's, you know, a two has a psychological boundary as tall as a curb. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right, like you can yeah. just cross that boundary anytime you want. They'll tell you everything. <laughs> They'll be just throwing up information and feelings in every Sounds direction. Really nice. yeah. huh? Sounds really nice. Huh? Sounds really nice. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then, but they have to learn mm -hmm. how to think more. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing with twos. I mean, part of their spiritual journey is to feel, le not feel less, but think equally. Right. Bring your thinking up to the level of your feeling. Yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, for fives, it would be the opposite journey, right? Mm, exactly. So I want you to think just as much as you do now. I just want you to bring feelings yeah. up to the same level. Um, and I think fives are, there is that child behind the fortress. 
and very sensitive. Uh, very f- and there's a lot of fear. You're in the fear triad, and yeah. so you've got this intellectualization. You've, you've interiorized fear, and you've intellectualized the world uh, in, in a posture of defense. But that doesn't mean that there's not the sensitive child inside. Yeah, I agree with that fully. <laughs> it, 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 well, you're right, though. I mean, my experience of that has been just, I mean, I have, my wife is a one. Um, and our, you know, she's constantly, just in our relationship, we're, we're that kind of couple where where she's always like, hey, I, I need to know a little bit more of you. Like, I need to know more about what you're feeling. You have mm. to kind of give me a little bit mm. more. And when I stopped, it's funny, when Jars stopped, um, touring really working creatively full-time her fear at one point was oh i'm not i'm never gonna know what he's thinking or feeling really anymore because wow because he's it would always come out in the songs and she would get this glimpse of like oh that's where he is Uh, that's where i am you know and um and then when i stopped kind of doing that for a while it was like oh i've i've lost my little cheat sheet like I didn't have it anymore. Um, but it's always been about that. Um, yeah, that inaccessibility is, is so that's a characteristic. So how, you know, as we sort of come, come toward a wrap here, um, you know, how, how have you, by the way, can you all hear the, I hope everyone can hear the sirens. Cause I think we're about to be arrested. Um, they found me. They found us. <laughs> they found us. I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back next week. <laughs> um, well, I guess the thing is, is that if we're trying to bring feeling up, if you're a self-aware five and you know, man, I like, I'm over reliant on my intellect. I'm, I, I, I tend to gather, I tend to live up I, in, inside my intellect as a defense against the world, against relationship. Mm-hmm. in some ways um how are, how has the journey toward connecting with the heart been for you like has there been a moment when it's like i where i am i'm living in my heart too not just my mind i'm living in my heart yeah i it's a it is a challenge it is an everyday challenge for me i think because it's easy to right. just stay in my head right um and it's pretty safe to be there um but yeah, that 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 work of feeling things and understanding what I'm feeling, and not letting it be something that's super um, uh, intimidating. Right. Maybe that that's that's an everyday feelings process. intimidate you. Um, I think they do, because um, they're there's they're a bit mysterious to me still. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, they, I think they are, they're intimidating at times. My wife is, you know, the, uh, it, it's funny. Like if we get in an, an argument, I will, <laughs> she just knows, she knows when it's like, my mind has just gone into like a fog because there is no way that I can understand or process the emotion that's coming at me. Like there is not enough in an, in a human interaction like that for me to be able to go, okay, I know exactly how to navigate this or I can empathize. Like it's just my head might as well have just fallen off of my body and just me somewhere else. Cause I cannot like, that would I, be a strong message. That wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. But it's, totally. yeah, it's like this wave just hits me and I, and then I become paralyzed. And, and so, so that, that is the, the work, the work for me really is, is going, okay, how do I, how do I understand my emotional side in a way that, and I look at, I even went there and that's even wrong. Like to say, well, I've got to understand my emotional side. Mm -hmm. How do I feel things and be okay with it? Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, What feeling most frightens you? Um, That's a good question. Um, I don't want to be, I think being embarrassed is the experience that most Mm. frightens me. Can you give me an example of what that looks Um, like? Being embarrassed, being kind of seen as inadequate or um, incapable of something 
that is a challenge. Like I don't, I don't want to experience that. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Like all I know is that I can order my world pretty well around, right. around making sure I'm not in a situation where I could be the, you know, look behind the curtain mm. and all of a sudden the great and powerful Oz is now, is just this, this kid. Like I will do all I can to defend myself from having that experience. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. very five. I mean, you just read right out of the playbook of fives, yeah. which is the fear of ineptitude and inadequacy. Yeah. This, and this is why fives play their preview and review game, right? Mm -hmm. Which is they want to, they don't ask a five to give a talk at the last minute. You know, they want to yeah. do a lot of prep. Yeah. A lot of preparation. And as you mentioned earlier, even preparation for relationship. Oh, yeah. I, I need time to prepare for this. I don't want to have a sudden relationship. I, I have to, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, uh, I wonder if if I if there's a five out there that, that had a uh, sort of a, um, what do you call it? Oh, gosh. You know, the expression suddenly falling in love, you know. It's, oh, yeah. It's, it's sort of like. An infatuation or, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah sort of like the moment right it's like yeah. usually it's a gradual kind yeah, of no love at first sight no no love yeah. at first sight yeah. <laughs> yeah hard for fives to do love at first sight yeah. is that is that fair i i think it's fair yeah yeah and then review is okay now I've, I've done the preview and then uh once i actually execute on whatever it was i was preparing for i mm -hmm. then review what happened um, oh yeah and so there's that emotion where the emotion may come out like with your wife, it's like, okay, we have to stop now because it's going to take me three days just to process what happened in this conversation. <laughs> right. It, what takes you three minutes is going to take me three days to emotionally process. Yeah. Yeah. And she's more aggressive. She's going to keep coming at you and you're going to keep running from room to room in the house to withdraw. Yeah. And we don't have many rooms in my house. So it's. <laughs> you do not have a room. Yeah. You don't have a mansion with many rooms. No, right? I know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean. You know, it's hard, right? I live in a marriage with a nine. We both withdraw. We go to our corners and yeah. just not talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that's been a journey for us is learning how to stay yeah. dealing with each other when we're hurt or when we're angry or disillusioned or disappointed mm -hmm. to really talk about it. Because we would much rather just go off by ourselves and lick our wounds Yeah, in our own ways. Well, and I would also say, so on another side too, there's... The, the whole thing about a five and inaction is mm -hmm. is a problem for me. Mm, talk um, about it. I think because, especially like in the season that I'm in right now in life, you know, any when I'm trying to make, you know, forge new ground in terms of like a career or doing something different than what I've done in the past, um, the idea, because I, I am very entrepreneurial, I'm very creative, but I'm also analytical and conceptual right. and so the actual acts that lead me into the the, the work that i want to be doing right. are like they're really hard to to embark on for me yeah. like i really have a hard time with that and that's the thing like if i ever get frustrated and go oh, i'm really i hate that i'm a five that's the reason it's because i just wish that i would be more active like i would just be able to just jump into something and do it yeah so like i have a friend of mine he's a five i've always had a lot of five friends um maybe because they're a good balance to my emotional side and i i'm especially in the second half of life i'm much more of a four of the fivey side mm -hmm. you know um, yeah because i'm a research fanatic in fact that'll kill me on books i'll read right. 50 books on the topic and never actually get down to right. writing yeah. fast enough you know mm -hmm. and um i think um the inaction piece that you're talking about is we can have this friend of mine, Hillary, it was a five. He would research like building a, uh, an Asian inspired shed in the back of the house for his workplace, his magical oh, yeah. withdrawing space. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And sounds and, glorious. Yeah. Right. And so then he researches for a year. And then finally, the pallet comes, the trucks have come, they're dropping off all the beams and the things because he's going to construct it. He's done all the of research, course, yeah. right? And then he's so exhausted from a year of research and he's kind of gotten sits. bored of thinking about it. The pallet is still in the backyard a year later. The thing has not gotten built. Yeah. Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right? It's like, man, I spent so much time researching it and getting excited about it. Now that it's here, I'm out of juice. 
Yeah. You know, I don't have the juice to actually mm-hmm. execute on it. I want to finish up with this. And this yeah. may actually, who knows where this is going to take us. All right. When you were 18, between 18 and 26, let's say, did you go down the Nietzsche wormhole? I, I didn't, but I also did in the sense that I, um, I was thinking about some of the ideas and concepts, but I wasn't necessarily aware yeah. that it was, it was his. Right. So, yeah. So I say this for those people who aren't, fr- aren't familiar with the work of uh, the philosopher and great, great, great thinker, Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, I could have said Sartre as well. Mm. Fours and fives share something. You, the two of us share something, which is we like to dance on the edge of the abyss. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it it wasn't the theologian Tillich. I think it, I can't remember who it was. It it may have been, but he talked about uh, Das Nichtige, which is the great nothing, Mm. the abyss, right? It's like the terror that human beings have about the void, the terrible void. Mm -hmm. And so fours and fives often fall into depression. They struggle with depression. They get, they dance too close to the void. Yeah. Um, And, it's uh, for fives. I think they they avoid the void <laughs> with information. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like a drink. Uh, yeah, avoid. Ad. Well, you know avoid what? Actually, the void. yeah. Well, I mean, but you know, <laughs> yeah. but seriously, yeah. Like every addiction can be rooted back at one level to avoiding the void. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like I can know. So fours and fives. I think of all those numbers struggle with depression and addictions. I mean. A mm-hmm. lot. I mean, it's like there, yeah. there is, but we are more, we have, we look down the, the hole, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's dark, it's deep and yeah. fives, man. Cause you're so, you can get so philosophical, so in your head. And then you start to see the dark side because you start doing the math. Oh, well, yeah. there is no God and there's this and there's that, mm-hmm. you know? And so there's this Nietzsche kind of moment sometimes for fives. They'll describe the Nietzsche space. Yeah. Does that ring or? Yeah. I, um, that absolutely rings with me. I mean, my story is, I was, yeah, I was in my twenties, right. When, um, when Jar started, we finished our first season of touring. That first album blew up for us. I came home and fell into, um, the kind of depression that, that I, that scares me to this day. Yeah. Like it was, it was the kind of thing where my phone would ring in my apartment and I would hide, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I was just panic attacks, mm-hmm. all of that. Um, that uh it just all caught up to me yeah um um and so i've but even kind of post that uh, experience of of severe depression that that f- for me was shorter than from a lot of people which i'm i'm How grateful it for it was probably about 6 months mm-hmm. for me was mm-hmm. was crawling out of that that the abyss i guess were people panicked um around you was management was the band. oh yeah were they all like oh my gosh what's happening to dan is this going to be is it going to bring down the house is it yes what? yeah that was all happening yeah management was freaking out people were like holy crap what are we going to do and um and the thing that happened on the other side of it was i lost the ability to bullshit hmm. that was like i used to be able to walk in a room and just kind of play the room, you know, and, and walk up to people and be the character and do all the stuff. And like, I couldn't do it. I didn't have, I didn't have a desire for any of that anymore. Mm. Like all of a sudden I, I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't need that anymore. And that was difficult to be in the music industry and not be able to walk in or not want to walk into a room and just work the room. Right. Um, and that was, but that was a big deal for me. That was a turning point. Um, and it was also the start of me being a little more comfortable with, with living on the edge of the abyss, you know, with, um, being okay with the melancholy, with being, having more questions than answers, right. like stepping into that space and going, all right, I'm going to take my hands off of this. Right. I'm not white knuckling it through anymore. I'm going right. to, going to let go of this and just. But it was it was that freedom to be mm. melancholy, and uh, yeah, I re- I relate to that totally. Yeah, I I went through a terrible depression in my late twenties. Uh, it happened around the time I was getting sober for the first time, and it was not easy. Uh, 
and it started with panic attacks and yeah. but it was i didn't know that the panic attack, panic attacks actually were a feature of the depression yeah and actually the doctor i saw couldn't figure out mm -hmm. oh wait a minute, you're having panic attacks because you're depressed not just because not, you have anxiety yeah it's like no you are in an agitated de a depression with an agitated state is what it's called right yeah right so um and i can just say to people man if you're depressed i get it it's like i can think of few darker times in my mm -hmm. life um than that season uh and i just think actually it was the first time of several when i had to um face uh, a backlog of trauma of growing up in an alcoholic home really a sociopathic father you know emotional yeah. physical abuse i mean it was nutty mm -hmm. nutty it was batshit crazy right yeah and i think um for a four what happens to many fours artists is they become flooded with feelings and they and there's no channel big enough for them yeah so they can't get it all out through music or their art or something else and then they start to drown and then the addiction yeah. sets in suicide sets in mm -hmm. just, just depression sets in and then really bad things can happen right yeah. fives i think you know instead of it being feelings it's thoughts it's thinking it is buried under the thoughts mm -hmm. that's what, and that's what it felt like to me it was the voice in my head that normally is a pretty temperate volume right was so excruciatingly loud right and i couldn't turn it off and yeah. it was just constantly every every thought was yeah. oh why did i do that oh so i shouldn't have been part of that or holy crap what do i really have enough for this right i shouldn't go there and right. it was so loud i couldn't turn yeah i just couldn't shut it down and fascinating and that yeah i kept going further and further inside my thoughts and yeah that was that was and i couldn't get out yeah. of my feelings oh do you see the i mean it's the yeah. same thing yep just two different experiences of flooding yeah from two different places in the body and in the heart and the mind right and, mm -hmm. and it's interesting you know like um sometimes people will draw and I would say they should be dotted lines between certain disorders and numbers, right? So one, maybe obsessive compulsive, if, if you were going right. to draw a dotted line, right? Yeah. Two, histrionic personality disorder. Three, some people would say narcissist. I think that's better for sevens, but, but you know, threes mm -hmm. are hard to peg actually. Fours would be borderline personality. Yeah. Fives would be schizoid or schizophrenic in a wow. way. Yeah. And that's what you're describing is the voice in the voices in the head, the thoughts. And I, right. again, I'm not saying the fives are schizophrenic, schizoid, right. but there is that quality, which you just described mm -hmm. of too many voices in the head. And, yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that was why like depression for me, like I was like, oh, you know what? What started to temper that was going out. And I actually had to start helping other people. Um, I had to do the exact opposite thing that felt comfortable for a five. I had to engage. Um, so the most unnatural thing to do was yeah. the thing that made the voices Loud. start to, well, it made them start to kind of temper again. I had to go like paint a fence for somebody and help somebody else save a cat from a tree. Like it right. was sort of like I had to just stop thinking about my problems. Um, and the only thing that would make me do that was, step into somebody else's um crisis in a way and like do yeah. something it was it's weird how that that yeah. happened but that was what what helped give me a foothold to start climbing right. back out well and of course yeah. in in aa or in 12-step communities mm -hmm. it's like pick up the phone and when you're in a bad space and go help another alcoholic or addict yeah get out of yourself and I think for you, for me, I got to get out of my feelings. Do you have to get out of your thoughts? Yeah. You know? And so that's important. All right. So we're going to wrap up and we, we've covered Nietzsche. We've covered Nietzsche. That was Boy, the, good. that was my big question for oh, you. Cause good. I wanted yeah, to know if, if you went to the Nietzsche yeah. abyss, uh, like I do, but yeah. for different reasons, mm -hmm. fours and fives do it, man. Yeah. We do it. We know how to do it. We never got to blood water and I'm sad about that. So we're going to have you back. Oh, great. And we'll talk about clean water for yeah. humans. Like that's a logical yeah, it's right? important. We all need it. Yeah, so, yeah, it's going around. Mm -hmm. um, where do people learn about blood water and all the work that you're doing? It's all in Africa, right? Isn't it's most all of it? Africa. Yeah, we're all there. We we basically help small African organizations, and a lot of people like this is a, a jump because people still have the idea that Africa is one giant sprawling game park 
you know, right. and Disney doesn't help that with, you know, only animals in their films. But we, uh, so we basically help these professionals that have these organizations in Africa right. provide clean water for people in their communities. Right. And then we, we grow these organizations and make them really strong with them um, so that we can kind of step out, graduate them and say, all right, go do this incredible work uh, efficiently. And it's amazing. It's been a fun story. We've helped over a million people have access to clean water. And that's a um, good day's work. Isn't it right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll get you out of bed in the morning to go do something good. Yeah. For the world. yeah. Um, and so it's been 15 years. But if you want to learn more about it, it's just bloodwater.org. And we we love having people come and connect with us. And we do we feel like we do the best work in that sector. Um, it's the most um, uh, affirming of people's dignity. It's development in a different way that actually empowers people to make the changes they need to make in their own communities. Well, Dan, this was as fun as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and uh, now I want to do more hang. Yeah. But don't let that scare you off. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Everybody, yeah. man, I hope you got to know more about Fives today. And um, what a joy to just have a little bit of a, a wander through the the parkland of the five you know and and your inner interior landscape so thanks for sharing it my and, pleasure uh, my dear friends remember the words of our friend oscar wilde be yourself everybody else is already taken